I'm away from the studio, traveling for the holidays, so sorry if this ends up sounding a little different from normal. I'm currently hiding underneath a blanket tent. I don't know if you can hear it, uh, talking into my portable field recorder in a bedroom on the outskirts of London. I didn't want to let a little holiday travel stop me from putting together a year-end roundup of some sounds. So it may be that I end up calling this what 2016 sounded like, but I could also responsibly call it what hiatus sounded like. What follows is five short sound-related tidbits from my last year. The first couple you may remember from the last reasonably sound year-end extravaganza. To start, this is the sound of every Instagram video that I recorded over the course of 2016 in chronological order. Headphone users, you might want to proceed with a little bit of caution. The Bluetooth device is read the Bluetooth device is connected successfully. And just for good measure, here are a few voice memo recordings as well.
So I'm here, I'm gonna test out this thing to see how good it sounds. Um, maybe it sounds really good, maybe it doesn't sound really good at all. Uh, I should probably do something. Let's see. And next, a sonification of my 2016 calendar. It sounds a little bit different from the last one, and I think maybe a little bit more interesting, hopefully. This was done with a combination of Google Calendar, regular expressions, Google Spreadsheets, and Super Collider. Each blip is one day, and the higher the pitch of the blip, the more individual events I had on that day. The program skips my empty days, so where you hear a steady, uninterrupted tone, that's a number of days where I had the same number of events several days in a row. According to Google, I had 349 events total, and on the busiest days, I had eight scheduled events. Next year, I hope to figure out how to make this sonification indicate where I was double booked. Anyway, here we go. During hiatus, I toyed with the idea of making episodes where I didn't actually make much of anything, since I sort of couldn't. One thing I thought about trying was a Lawrence Wiener-style episode, but with audio. If you don't know Wiener's work, it's really great. He's one of my favorite artists, and I think he's probably considered somewhere between a conceptual and a minimalist artist. His work is often found in contemporary and minimalist museums and collections, and they're normally these pieces, which I think, if I remember correctly, he calls sculptures, that are made almost exclusively of lettering applied to surfaces. Big block letters on a gallery wall, on the exterior of a building, on the concrete or pavement outside. Sometimes they're stencil style, sometimes they're stylish and typographic, almost designy. And occasionally there's a kind of shape or a graphic element, like an arrow, a square, an underline. The text in the works often describe arrangements of physical materials or just general processes. Some examples of his pieces are things like Two blocks of tempered steel, both equally heavy, one wet and the other dry. Things themselves on top of other things, on top of something else, now and then. A translation from one language to another. One quart exterior green industrial enamel thrown on a brick wall. The Listen Gallery, who represents Wiener in London and Milan, says Wiener describes his medium as, quote, language and the material referred to, in the sense that language is a material for construction. Wiener himself describes the circumstances of his work in his Declaration of Intent from 1968. It reads as follows. 1. The artist may construct the piece. 2. The piece may be fabricated. 3. The piece need not be built. Each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist, the decision as to condition rests with the receiver upon the occasion of receivership. So during hiatus, I thought maybe I would cop some of Wiener's style, and I wrote a number of Wiener-style instructions with the intention that they'd construct a certain sound idea which could be fabricated but need not be built. What follows is the entirety of those instructions. There are 15 in total, but some of them are multi-part. Loud enough that it would wake your neighbors, not so loud they would call the police. 
a number of very small sounds, which, individually, may be near silence, but together become audible. The sound you make when you remember a time you did something embarrassing. After you are out of sight and earshot of your significant other who has just done something to anger you, but it's not worth bringing up because it's really not that big a deal, you're just sort of frustrated, maybe about other things. The first line of dialogue from a movie you hate. The first line of dialogue from a movie you love. Sunday morning. The cork on that bottle of scotch you've been waiting for a special occasion to open. Long enough that you get used to it, but then it gets weird, and then funny, and then unpleasant, and then incredible, and so on. Made between two friends. Made between two strangers. Made between two strangers aiming to become friends. Made between two friends who have become strangers. Transferred across a border. Made in a place with no barrier. Made directly into or at a barrier. Small and quiet. Quiet but not small. Large and quiet. Quiet but not large. Many sounds on top of one another. Many next to one another. From your living room where you drink your morning tea, but not that. These pieces may be fabricated. They need not be built. Yeah. So, you know what they say, if you show a Game Boy in the first act, you have to use it in the third. In the Bits and Chips episode from before hiatus, I mentioned that I had purchased an old Game Boy, refurbished and backlit as a Christmas present for myself, which, you know, I did. I, I did actually end up doing that. I've had it for a year now, and I have played a lot of Pokemon Red. This year's self-Christmas present was a Nano Loop Mono cartridge for that Game Boy. If you don't know Nano Loop, they're in the pantheon of 8-bit music software giants. Along with other projects like LSDJ, Nano Loop makes hardware and software for producing 8-bit music on a wide range of platforms. I use the Nano Loop iOS program to write these like funny little tunes on the train platform and stuff. Their mono cartridge is new and notable in that they've managed to figure out how to get a 100% analog signal path from the cartridge to the headphone out of the Game Boy with the expense of some instruments and functionality. Nanoloop 1.7 has two rectangle wave, one custom waveform where you can draw it yourself, and one noise channel. Nanoloop Mono, which is what I bought, has only one rectangle, one click, and one noise track. So three total. So, apart from sounding very, very nice, because it's an analog-only thing, I guess, I don't know, I think it sounds nice, maybe I've just fooled myself, it is also a bit more limited, I think, in a really fun way. I've only had it for a week, and I'm not as fast at it as I am with the phone version, but here's a small little piece of music I made on the plane to London a few days ago. To say 2016 has been a shit year for losing great and important people would be an understatement. If I were to dedicate time to every meaningful creative giant who died this year, this end of the year episode would become an end of the year multi-part special lasting well into next year. 
Even in the last 36-hour period before recording this, I've learned of the deaths of both Rick Parfit of Status Quo and George Michael, so it's been rough, to say the least. So instead of going on and on, and instead of trying to do the impossible and pay respects to everyone at once, I'm just going to share a few thoughts about three people who died this year who had a specific and important impact on me, and whose loss I feel particularly. The first is David Bowie, who died on January 10th, and who, I mean, like, what do you even say at this point? When trying to put into words my relationship to David Bowie and his work, I can't help but think very self-consciously, I might add, about how Rainier Maria Rilke wrote about his relationship to God. Translated into English from the German by Robert Bly, he wrote, I live my life in growing orbits, which move out over the things of the world. Perhaps I can never achieve the last, but that will be my attempt. I am circling around God, around the ancient tower, and I have been circling for a thousand years. And I still don't know if I am a falcon or a storm or a great song. Part of me is sure Bowie would wince at being called a god, but a tower, sure, a planet, a star, perhaps more likely, a celestial body around which so much art, people, ideas, spun and often collided. And here I am, maybe sure of what I'm orbiting, but unsure of my relationship to it. A spectator? A nuisance? A danger? Some artful thing of great potential? However I may relate, the tower remains. Since his death, there has been some detective work concerning Bowie's final release, the triumphant parting gift Black Star. The gatefold LP cover contains, its designer has suggested, more than a few secrets if one is willing to put the object through its paces. Look at it this way from that and the star reflects some hidden pattern. Place it here in the sunlight and it reflects there thusly and maybe even wears away some, and more, apparently. What a perfect encouragement, I think, to never forget the usefulness of Bowie's work, or any artist's, for that matter. The work of a lost creative giant may be taken at face value, but put through its paces in unexpected ways, perhaps ways not possible or encouraged while they lived, we may find new uses and hidden functions dormant features and unexpected perspectives as we orbit around the creator no longer, but their work forevermore as a falcon, a storm, or a great song. Jean-Claude Risset died on November 21st. Alongside the late Max Matthews, a founding father of computer music after whom the well-known music software Max MSP is partially named, and John Chowning, the man widely credited with inventing FM synthesis, the importance of which is very difficult to overstate, Risset is considered one of the early pioneers of electronic music. While working at Bell Labs in the 60s with Matthews, Risset co-developed a system for synthesizing the sounds of brass instruments, the first of its kind, and he would then go on to bring the first synthesizer to France in the early 70s. Called the Orsay, in the middle of the 70s, it inspired famed conductor Pierre Boulez to request that Risset head the computer music division of IRCOM, a then nascent center for music and acoustic research in France, which is now world-renowned. Risset's musical works are like high church of respected foundational electronic music. Mutations and Sood are among the best and most well-known electronics pieces of the 20th century and laid some of the groundwork for music in the later part of the century which places electronics first. However, Risset's most well-known contribution to the field may be the Shepard Risset Glissando, a tone which sounds always like it's increasing or decreasing in pitch. You may remember it from the Auditory Illusions episode of Reasonably Sound. Here's an example that I made myself a few years back.
Risset applied similar techniques to percussion, making rhythms sound as though they were always speeding up or slowing down. The effect is um, dizzying, I think is the word. Here's an example that I made myself. There's a lot about Risse and his work that I really love. He was not, at least not as far as I know, or as far as what's communicated directly by his work, a personality, a star, a performer, but an artist, a researcher, and a professor, a teacher. And his pieces have this quality about them. They're statements being made, problems being solved, and possibilities expertly explored. There's something beautiful and practical, and almost astute about them. I studied for a really short amount of time at a small electronic music studio in Paris, not far from IRCOM, but rather far from Marseille, which was where Risset lived and worked by that time. Not long after classes began, needing to set up a small studio where I lived, I took the train out to the mall with a friend and bought the middlest, mid-level speakers I could find. Alltech Lansing, Plastic, gray, maybe like 30 euros. A few days later, one of my classmates showed up to my place with an employee from the studio in tow. I put on some music and over beers, we talked about my journey to get the speakers. And embarrassed, I said, well, I mean, I, I had to get something, right? And it's not like I'm going to buy nice studio monitors for just a month in Paris. And uh, the tech, the employee, he said, oh, these? Yeah, yeah those are fine. Jean-Claude uses them. And I said, who? who? Jean-Claude, he said. Risset? Jean-Claude Risset. He has the exact same speakers in his studio. I'm not sure if he was kidding. I didn't ask. He didn't hint. On November 24th, Pauline Oliveros died. Pauline was a hugely influential figure in minimalist and electronic music. She was a nearly lifelong accordion player, one of the founding members of the San Francisco Tape Music Center. Her work is wide-ranging, and recommending one piece would be really tough. Accordion and voice is very good, as is Four Meditations. I really like mnemonics. Deep listening is probably a classic starting point. And Pauline was actually a pioneer of a method that she called deep listening, and a founder of the Deep Listening Institute in Kingston, New York. Deep listening exists at the intersection of a lot of things. Meditation, mindfulness, ritual, improvisation, and instrumental performance with forays into philosophy, behavioral psychology, acoustics, epistemology, and more. The overall goals of deep listening are many, but the emphasis is on knowing your environment and in the process, knowing something about yourself and living, or at least acting a little better through that knowledge. Pauline's idea rests on the difference between hearing and listening. Hearing, Pauline said, is a physical process. It's the process of sound waves hitting some physical and physiological apparatus that then results in electronic impulses being sent into the brain. Listening, on the other hand, is directing one's attention to those impulses and attempting to learn from them. Pauline wrote in her book, Deep Listening, a composer's sound practice, that deep listening comes from noticing my listening or listening to my listening and discerning the effects on my body-mind continuum, from listening to others, to art, and to life. Deep listening is a practice and a term that does not come from any religious context, even though religious practitioners sometimes use the words. Later in her book, she writes, deep listening is a process that extends the listener to this continuum, as well as to focus instantaneously on a single sound, engagement to targeted detail, or sequence of sound slash silence. 
In order to acquire the discipline and control that meditation develops, relaxation as well as concentration is essential. The practice of deep listening is intended to facilitate creativity in art and life through this form of meditation. Creativity means the formation of new patterns, exceeding the limitations and boundaries of old patterns, or using old patterns in new ways. Pauline describes animals as deep listeners and says there's a way we can think of listening as being not just about creativity and mind expansion, but survival. To listen is to know one's environment and knowing one's place in that environment. Two things needed to survive. I was lucky enough to have met Pauline several times, and I saw her perform many times. A close friend from college worked with her at the deep listening space in Kingston. And once, many years back, he invited me to a performance that he worked on with Pauline, an event that was part of the Deep Listening Dream Fest, a yearly sleeping and dreaming-oriented festival of talks and concerts co-organized by Pauline's longtime partner, Ione. The event was a sleep concert, which was kind of exactly what it sounds like. You show up, pajamas and all, and you sleep on a beanbag, in a sleeping bag on the floor, while you listen to music. Pauline was there with her accordion. Ione was there too. There were some live electronic music elements and plenty of soothing noises to cover up any snoring and murmuring. There was a bit of dim lighting and some projections. But mostly it was dark. Pauline also wrote about how sounds carry intelligence. Ideas, feelings, and memories are triggered by sounds. I often think about that and her sleep concert. In a room filled with strangers, I and probably most of those strangers went to sleep, did one of the most vulnerable things that a person can do. And honestly, I never thought twice about it. Pauline's reputation and that of the space were a factor, of course, but the sounds also did lots of work to soothe to communicate a kind of safety and to trigger those feelings of calm, relaxation, and support. The sleep concert, for me at least, encouraged a kind of deep listening and through it delivered a message that it was okay eventually to stop listening and to sleep. I can't imagine anyone other than Pauline being able to create that space at all, let alone doing so significantly with sound. And last, but certainly not least, what's the point of looking backwards without looking ahead? What's going to happen with Reasonably Sound in 2017? The long and short is, I'm not sure, but hopefully next year's calendar sonification has more high beeps than low ones, and that there are just as many works built as there are ones which may be fabricated. Reasonably Sound has, of course, only been back for a really short while, but in that short while, you all have done so much to encourage me and support the show. You've given to the Patreon, which makes it possible to keep on keeping on. You've written reviews on iTunes, which I, I can't stress this enough, is huge. You've shared the show with your friends. You've written comments and shared stuff with me on Twitter and Instagram and SoundCloud. You've made episode topic requests, most of which I think are actually going to happen. All of this after nearly a year-long hiatus, no less. It makes me really hopeful about what we can do down the road and the kinds of things we'll be catching up on in this year-end episode when 2018 is around the corner. To be perfectly honest, right now the plan is to get and stay in the groove of just producing episodes, lest another hiatus befall us. And to figure out where the show fits in the world of podcasts, in the world of sound podcasts, which there are definitely more of now than when Reasonably Sound started. And to also figure out where the show fits within the world of, I don't know, educational media, I guess? Is that what this show is? As always, your reactions and guidance to episodes and ideas and topics along the way are not only appreciated, but they are treasured. No fooling. My hopes for Reasonably Sound are big, but right now my plans are very modest. By this time next year, hopefully we'll have some merch. 
We're pretty close to that goal on the Patreon right now, actually, so that's, I think, an attainable goal. And maybe even by then, Reasonably Sound will have employee number one, or two, I guess, as the case may be. Am I employee zero or am I employee one? Anyways, something for the lawyers to figure out. Having a producer would be neat, but hey, we got to keep the lights on first. We got to keep the episodes coming second. Buy me a coffee now and again, third. One thing I really am looking forward to in 2017 is having a small meetup in Brooklyn where if you're around, if you can make it, if you can come join me and some of my other sound nerd friends, we can all drink some things and ring in both the new year and the return of Reasonably Sound. Keep an eye out for that in the next month or two. But until then, and long after, hopefully, let's keep in touch about the, you know, surprising ways that audio can help us make sense of an only ever increasingly complicated world. Or maybe seemingly increasingly complicated. I have no doubts that the next year is going to be interesting. And sincerely, thanks again. Thanks for everything. Happy holidays and a happy new year. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Reasonably Sound. <laughs>